In chapter 24 of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection from the dead and declares, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So it's always been part of Christian belief, not simply that the death of the Messiah was prophesied in the Old Testament, but also that his resurrection from the dead was prophesied in the Old Testament. Dr. Michael Brown explains. So as we look at some of the most famous messianic prophecies like Isaiah 52.13 to 53.12, which is commonly called Isaiah 53, or Psalm 22, these are some of the most powerful resurrection prophecies. So we see in Isaiah 52.13 that the servant of the Lord will be highly exalted, highly lifted up. An ancient homiletic rabbinic commentary called the Midrash says that, that he'll be higher than Abraham, more exalted than, than Moses, even more lifted up than the ministering angels. And yet first, he suffers terrible disfigurement, suffers actual death that we read of in Isaiah 53. And yet it says he will prolong his life. So how do you prolong your life after death? It is called resurrection. There's even an interesting passage that says he will see seed. Now, some say that means he'll have physical children. Actually, it's a unique expression that's found only there in the Hebrew Bible. But it, how do you see anything, offspring, posterity, after death? It's called resurrection. So it's speaking of a future seed, a future generation of Israel that he'll see, or his spiritual disciples, he will see that after death. And then in Psalm 22, the, the psalmist is delivered from the jaws of death. And it's interesting, the language there could well describe the language of crucifixion. And Psalm 22 was written before crucifixion existed as a death penalty. It was not known in ancient Israel at that time. And, and, and yet it describes the, the psalmist being publicly exposed and stretched out. And, and it could well be based on ancient Hebrew text that it says, they pierced my hands and my feet. But we know for sure that he's in the situation apparently forsaken by God. When he's delivered from the jaws of death, the, the deliverance is so powerful that when you get to the end of Psalm 22, it's that this story of God's faithfulness will be proclaimed until the whole world praises the God of Israel, that people around the world will worship the God of Israel based on this testimony of deliverance. So I asked the simple question, which ancient Jew was delivered from the jaws of death, rose from the dead, and the testimony is such that it brings praises to God, the God of Israel throughout the world, only one possible candidate. You even have passages like Psalm 16, which uh, on, on the most basic meaning, it seems that the psalmist is speaking about being delivered from death and delivered from suffering. But the language is interesting because it's not just speaking about death. It, it uses terms about corruption and the netherworld. And, and yet somehow the psalmist knows and believes that he's going to be maintained and delivered. And Peter says that David who wrote Psalm 16 is a prophet saw ahead the resurrection of the Messiah. David may have been meditating on his own life and seen himself protected and delivered by God, but what he's actually seeing, and now he understands, he's actually seeing the resurrection of the Messiah. He's the one who is delivered from corruption. And interesting, interestingly, rabbinic Judaism says that there are seven people who are actually delivered from the corruption of the grave, David being one of them. So it's not speaking of a literal resurrection, but, but Peter in Acts 2 understands, yeah, that's what Psalm 16 is literally speaking about. Uh, so the fact that you have prophecies that speak of the Messiah's death, and then you have prophecies speaking of him being a light to the nations and his message going out to the entire world means that his death does not end things. And hence, Psalm 110, where the Messiah is spoken of, David slash the Messiah is spoken of as a priest forever after the other of Melchizedek. So the priest makes atonement for sin, deals with sin, takes our place as an intercessor that it says to this one, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That also requires resurrection.
if you're going to die an ignominious death, if you're going to die and suffer for the sins of others, and yet sit at the right hand of God until your enemies are put under your foot, that requires resurrection. And it's interesting that out of all passages in the Hebrew Bible, the one that's most often quoted in the New Testament is Psalm 110, the Psalm of the Resurrection and Ascension. So, according to the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, the Messiah would suffer and die for the sins of the world, rise from the dead, and be a light to all nations. If that's not about Jesus, then the world just doesn't make sense.